Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Bible Discovery, the weekend show. So on this show, we are reading through the Bible this year with Bible Discovery and Bible Discovery TV. And on this weekend program, we talk about big issues that pop up as we're reading through the Bible. And we also respond to some of your comments and aim to answer or at least begin to answer and discuss some of your questions as well. Now, Due to some unforeseen circumstances, I am not joined by Matlock today. Our kids have been really sick. They're on the mend now, but not well enough to come into work with us today, uh, which is what normally happens when we tape. But thankfully, my dad has graciously saved my skin today and come in to tape with us so that we can still air this show this weekend. So. Here's my dad, Rod. Thank you so much for joining me, Dad. You're welcome, Corey. I don't know if I've saved your skin, but you have. Uh, it's good to be here. <laughs> and good to be on the weekend edition as we study numbers one through 24. Absolutely yeah. outstanding. So that's our reading that for this week, one, one to 24. Um, now we did have a couple questions trickle in from Exodus and Leviticus uh, from our comment section. So we're gonna we're gonna look at those first, and then we're gonna move on to numbers. Do some housekeeping, you know. One of the things that uh, people often ask the question about is they're trying to place the Exodus, and they're trying to figure yes. that out. It's and a hot topic, isn't it? It is, and there's you know, I mean, <laughs> Steven Spielberg did the Prince of Egypt and a whole big thing, and, and everybody thought Ramesses. But this question comes from uh, Jolly Jester three nine two three. And it says this, Corey, and this is a question for you. Uh, the New King James, Exodus 1 to 3, on Bible discovery, Corey had a great video about the timing of the Exodus, but it left some unanswered questions. Pharaoh Ramesses 2 was question, uh, was the question marked, and then it was determined the Exodus wasn't in the 1200s, but in the 14, but in 1446 BC. Who was the Pharaoh then, and who was it during Joseph's time? Thank you. Thanks, Jolly Jester, for the question. It did leave unanswered questions. Uh, that was mainly due to time constraints. But, all right, so the leading theory for the Pharaoh of the Exodus at a 1446 BC date is Amenhotep II. So Amenhotep II, I cannot remember right now off the top of my head who that places as Joseph's Pharaoh, but I have a recommendation for you. So uh, there are two places that you can go to read uh, scholarly research on this that's accessible. So the first place that I would send you would be Associates for Biblical Research. You can just uh, type that into a search engine and their website will pop up. I think it's biblearchaeology.org. They have a great, they have great resources when it comes to um, uh, search, uh, like they have a good search bar on there where you can look up um, research on the time period of the Exodus. And they have some great articles that break down the timeline and make those associations. Those are briefer articles, but they're very, very good. They're written by uh, current archaeologists working in Israel right now. Another place that I would send you would be to academia.edu. Um, and Douglas Petrovich, Dr. Douglas Petrovich has I think I think the the longest and most thorough thorough article that I'm aware of talking about Amenhotep II as the Exodus Pharaoh, and in that he goes back, he tracks back, and he looks at the potential for Joseph Pharaoh as well. So those are the two places that I would send you: Associates for Biblical Research, BibleArchaeology.org, and then Academia.edu. Looking up Douglas Petrovich, and in his loaded up articles on there on his profile on Academia, you'll be able to find. Uh, some articles on the Exodus Pharaoh, Amenhotep II, and even, I think, even Joseph. I think it's important to remember that most of the world, or most, I shouldn't say the world, most of the people in public see the Exodus as happening around 1200, but I see, like you do, that it was clearly earlier than that, 200 yeah. years earlier than that, at least. And uh, I, I was with Dr., uh, well, he, he's just a great guy, um, Gary Bates, and yeah. uh, he did a great job, but he's into the Egypt thing. Yes. And he went to Egypt and he saw this particular Pharaoh, the mummy of this Pharaoh. Yep. And he said he couldn't believe it. He was there watching 
looking at the body of the mummy of the Pharaoh. Yeah. So I had to argue with Moses. Really, really well, interesting. And, and that dynasty that Amenhotep II is a part of, like the the he's he's just after the uh, Tutmos, the yeah. the Tutmos uh, pharaohs, which is really interesting because Moses's name is in Tutmos. So I mean, if you're trying to, there's so many different things as to why. Uh, why Amenhotep II is a really good candidate, uh, but I think that's one of the that's one of like the the ones where people go oh because they don't realize like yeah. right Moses was named by yeah. by Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, it's, it's really because all of all of the people assume it was twelve hundred, but when you realize the truth that it was actually what we believe it was fourteen forty six. Yeah, that shifts everything. Yeah, and changes everything. So yeah, and then, and then you, then then it, it it affects the way you look at the time period of the judges and the way that you look at the arrival of the Philistines and and the way that you look at 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 um, a lot of the destruction layers in in Israel. Yeah. So it yeah. it plays out. So then, it, like when you're testing a theory, if that 1446 BC theory works, it should work all along the timeline. And I think that there's been some really good archaeologists and historians that have shown that hey, this works pretty well. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Next question comes. It's related to Leviticus. Uh, the, the question says, thank you, Corey and Matlock. I'm not Matlock, but Matlock's with your kids at home. Uh, thank you for all you do. So please answer this question for me in Leviticus 12, 4 to 8. Mm -hmm. A woman who gives birth must give burnt offerings as well as a sin offering. Burnt offerings as well as a sin offering. Two different kinds of offerings. And now we are all sinners. And we sin every day. But what sin has the woman committed that she must atone for? Thank you, and God bless you. And that comes from Rose Mary uh, Waldschmidt, uh, LL4SZ. Thank you, Rose Mary. All right. Um, so the, sh the the short answer to this is no one knows with the because it is true that Leviticus prescribes a burnt offering and a sin offering, and this is within the chapters of Leviticus that talks about becoming ritually unclean or ritually impure, which is not a sin in and of itself. So uh, to be ritually impure just means to be human, essentially. And because the people were involved in the worship of God and because they were supposed to be different from the other cultures, they had this, 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 um, this purity culture, for lack of a better term, that they had to separate themselves from normal humanity in order to achieve a, a more godly status, a more godlike status. And so we see everyday human issues and human sicknesses being unclean, but not sinful. But it is true that here in childbirth, it, it she does have a burnt offering, which would be regular for the ritual impurity of blood, because whenever there's blood or any kind of bodily discharge, it makes you ritually unclean. Because again, human, right? God doesn't have those things. So this, this is hu a human issue. So whenever there's a human issue, you offer a burnt offering, so that it changes your status to ritually clean and you can be involved in worship uh, worship services and things of that nature once again. Now, sin offering, the sin offering. No one believes, or at least most people, most scholars and most Christians, and, and I think even within Judaism, no one believes that childbirth is a sin. Now, this is because it was ordained by God and you go back and you look at examples of childbirth before the Mosaic law and it's there's no intimation anywhere in the scripture that this is sinful. I mean, think of uh, Eve having Cain and Abel, right? She says, I have given birth with the help of God. This is a good thing. It was actually a command of God and God does not command sin. He says, be fruitful and multiply, right? He doesn't say go sin and multiply right this is this is a command of god to be fruitful and multiply so childbirth in and of itself is not a sin so what is this sin offering for well there's two theories and i think one is probably more likely 
two theories that I'm aware of, and you can jump in here, Dad, if you know of more. One is that because it's been such a long time that the woman has been ritually impure, the chances of her having committed a sin, even unintentionally, is very great. Because in the case of a male, it was 33 days. In the case of a female, it was 66 days. So this is a long time period. So this is just a blanket, like, reintroduction into the community that her and her husband would have to, you know, foot the bill for, whether that was a lamb or whether that was the more... Uh, modest sacrifice of the dove or, you know, the pigeon. Another theory that I've heard as well is that this is a general sin offering for the child and kind of like for the future of the child to introduce them into the community. I lean less on this one and more on it's probably a blanket unintentional sin offering for the woman because she has been uh, in her, like, um, in her separation from the community for such a long time. What do you think? Well, well, it's it's interesting because this is another way, if we come forward and look at the time when Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. died on the cross and took the cost of our sin, and then he paid that price, gave his life, and three days later rose from the dead in the flesh, seen by over 500 men according to the Bible. As we look at that, we understand that Jesus Christ has paid for all the sin. And so this is an amazing way in the time we live right now, Rosemary, the time we live right now, that Jesus Christ has covered all of our sin. And the sin offering was very significant and very important. I believe that it was a little bit of both, but I believe that that this is a way that Jesus Christ today that we see how he has covered our sin and that we see that works. You know what? When you were saying that, what it just made me it just made me think of something else with perhaps the sin offering when it comes to childbirth looked back to Genesis 3 when God prophesies to Eve that or, or and I or is it to this is it to the serpent? He prophesies to the serpent. Prophesies to the serpent that the seed of the woman so the woman's child will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will only be able to bite his heel. So perhaps, perhaps this sin offering for a woman during childbirth carries on that tradition and that hope that at some point through childbirth, sin will be dealt with once and for all. And it was with Jesus Christ. And it was with Jesus Christ. So So maybe that was a way of, you know, bridging that time gap, looking back towards the original. That's what the Bible does, is it shows us the connections of time. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and uh, but a very, very good answer, Corey. The next question comes, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, It says, what was commanded in Numbers 1, 1 through 16, and why was a census okay here, but not in Second Samuel 24, right. 1 to 17? Right, right, David. right, right, right. <laughs> yes. So what was the deal there, Corey? Okay, so okay, so in Numbers 1, we have Moses and Aaron taking a census uh, of Israel, but specifically of Israel's fighting men, of their warriors, while they're still at Mount Sinai. Uh, But I think what's really interesting that we need to note is that in verse 2 of Numbers 1, God says, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel. So this census in Numbers chapter 1 was commanded by God. Now, why would God command a census of the people of Israel on their exit from the promised land while they're at Mount Sinai after they have received the law. And I think uh, a main answer for this is for posterity's sake, so that we can see the number of the number of Israel and the uh you know, and, and, and the next generations could see the number of Israel at the beginning of the wilderness wandering period, and then the number of Israel at the end of the wilderness wandering period. Uh, and it's different because that generation uh, sins irrevoc- irrevocably against God, and they die in the wilderness. And it's that next generation that goes in. So you get to see 
you know, what's going on. Also, it would have been really practical for Moses and Aaron because they had to arrange the camp, right? And so God tells them how to arrange the camp, but it's based off of the numbers of the tribes as well. So this is a really practical thing in Numbers chapter one. Uh, and it, it also for posterity's sake, for those next generations and those next generations, they can see, you know, where they came from, where Israel came from in the Exodus. Now, when we jump forward to 2 Samuel chapter 24, we have a very, 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 very different situation where we have, um, we have, let me just read it for you. 24 verse one. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he incited David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my Lord the king still see it. But why does my Lord the king delight in this thing? So we have, we have a very different situation where God is, is bringing out the, the sin of David's heart and the sin of the people of Israel so that he can bring on them punishment because apparently they've walked away from his covenant in some way. Um, now, as to why taking a census was wrong, I believe it's, it, it harkens back to Deuteronomy 17, where the king is not supposed to trust in things that traditionally give the king power, like the number of his fighting men. He's not supposed to care about that. He's supposed to care about as long as the people and he are right with God, God's going to protect them. Doesn't matter how many this, the, the, the people are. Now, how we know that this was common knowledge is because even the commander of the military, Joab, who wasn't always like the most righteous person, even he knew this was a bad idea. And he tries to stop David from doing it. He knows that they're not supposed to know the number, they're not supposed to look on with pride. Like this is a David thing going, look at what I've accomplished. Look at my military. Look at my people. Yes, right? Bad idea. I think it is. I, you know, the thing that's fascinating is that it's clear that Israel also was sinning. And Israel's a big part of this. And a lot of people focus on David. Yes. But God is frustrated with the sin that's taking place in Israel. This would come out in the time of Solomon as well. Uh, in Solomon, they call it the Golden Kingdom. But anyway, it's a long story. It's a lot of corruption. <laughs> There's a kingdom. lot of corruption. But, <laughs> Yikes. But God brings the wrath, his wrath, on Israel through David and David himself. This is a really good good point. And you just, one of the things that is interesting about that story is he gives David three choices. And David says, you know what? Let me fall in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. Because if anybody knows mercy, mm -hmm. he knows that it's God. Don't let me fall in the hands of the enemy. Don't let me fall in any of the sicknesses. I'll fall in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. And that's the secret to David's attitude. It wasn't that he sinned but it was how he dealt with the sin. And that's where God calls us today in Jesus Christ. And he says, I know you're a sinner. You have to recognize that. How do you deal with that mm -hmm. sin? That's the question. How do we deal with this sin? And my suggestion, very strong suggestion, is do what Jesus said. Bring it to him. And he has paid the cost. He's taking care of it. And that was what David did. It's a very, very interesting passage. Well, yeah. And, and I think to your point, the results of that are actually really good. As brutal as it is, and this is a really brutal time. This is a time of black and white, of life and death. We get that through reading the Samuels, right? We realize, oh, wow, it's not like today <laughs> where everything is nice, right? Uh, no, it's, it's, it, everything is life and death, black and white, and God speaks the language of that culture, he speaks in a way that they're going to understand. And so we see God dealing with the sin of the people, God drawing out of David issues that David needs to deal with. But the result is that David has a very humbled attitude towards God and he builds an altar where the temple eventually is going to stand, right? So it paves the way for something new yeah. in Israel, which is, I think it's really interesting how it God really always is. do that. Yeah. Okay, I want, I want to turn the tables on you because you've been asking me questions, so now, here we go. Are you ready for it? 
<laughs> I have no choice and I have no... I, go ahead. <laughs> this is what we do on the weekend show. Hot seat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's just kidding. Okay. So this question is about numbers four. Uh, good morning. I have a question. Where did the Israelites get the hides from a sea cow from? Aren't sea cows manatees? Thank you and God bless. And this is from Deborah D. A lot of people, uh, let me just say that we, we spend a lot of time on details that are related to the translations. Yes. And they're not necessarily in the original Hebrew. Um, Nevertheless, Deborah, this is something that we have to focus on. Uh, and Matlock put together some notes here, and I thank you, Matlock, for doing this. The King James Version, the New King James Version, call it badger skins. The Holman's Christian Standard Bible calls it manatee skins. The other, the MSG calls it dolphin skins. The American Standard Version calls it sea skins. The ESV, English Standard Version, the RSV and the NLT, New Living Translation, calls it goat skins. And so the NIV calls it durable leather. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and leather, of course, we know comes from cowhide. And then the CSB calls it fine leather. So there's a lot of translations for this. Now, the answer to the question would be, we don't know, but I, I will tell you this. I was in... Israel, we were in a, the war, first war, 1991, had been declared, and it was a really interesting time because all the flights left and the TV crew was stranded in Israel. You were home with mom and all that stuff, and we were stuck there for six weeks, and I was out in the desert, and we were just praying and asking God to help us, and I saw these unbelievable animals. They were really good at climbing up the rocks about this big and this wide. And they had this amazing fur and, and hair. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I learned there's hundreds of thousands of them living in the mountains. So there's animals that live there. And that made this come to life to me. And I realized, I see what God is doing, using what you have, mm -hmm. where you're at, to make the covers and to make all of this for the Holy of Holies and all of that. So it, it's important for us not to get tied up into how could this be a seal skin or a manatee skin when it's not even close to the ocean. Instead of making those details, mm -hmm. understand that the translation, it's hard to say what the translation is, but to to realize that they're skins of animals. So that's what I would say. Yeah, because because y your point is well taken that no one really knows what to do with this word. So they all translate it a little bit differently. I think, if memory serves me right, I think Ryan might have an article on the website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, about this, exploring kind of this issue. Because there's always like, people are like, yeah, but they could have traded because the Mediterranean Sea is right there and the Red Sea is right there. I mean, it's possible. But you're, it's possible. But again, you're, you're applying something <laughs> yes, to it. Yes. Your mind is applying something to it. Yeah. Like we're, we're just really not sure. Exactly. We're just really not sure. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately. Okay, dad, another one for you from numbers six. Is there a relationship between the new covenant and the Nazarite vow? Uh, and can a Christian still take a Nazarite vow today? This is an interesting question. A, a Nazarite vow is, uh, of course, number six has the, the details on it. And it, it's a, it, it appears to be a kind of way that you set yourself apart for a time and, and you say, I won't do this, I won't do this, I won't do this, I won't do this, I won't shave, I won't drink, I won't, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that the way to answer this question would be to, to say that there's no real relation between the new covenant and the Nazarite vow. It really doesn't happen. Right. Um, the new covenant is the covenant of Jesus Christ when he gave his life and we killed him. He gave his life, allowing us to terminate his life. And then three days later, he came back to life. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion we can have about that. But that's a totally different thing than the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow is a thing when you, it, it's something that you do when you want to get separate. Now, some people have said today, that they want to separate themselves somewhat. So they fast a meal or they fast meals or whatever they do. And we say that that's good, but you need to hear the Holy Spirit on that. That's very, very important. Now there is 
there is a relationship between setting yourself to understand God. When you come to God in the new covenant and you say, Jesus Christ, come into my life, be the Lord of my life. You know, Corey, when you do that, when you make the Lord the Lord of your life, you're separating yourself from the reality of life in this earth mm -hmm. because things become different. Your priorities shift and change. Your priority becomes spiritual. And so that changes the way you think. So I think it's important to remember not to put too much emphasis on the Nazarite vow, but to remember that the new covenant is separate. It's something that we all come to Christ in, mm -hmm. but there is time when in our life of living for Jesus Christ, when we want to separate ourselves and fast and do whatever, that's okay. But we need to keep in mind that the new covenant is for everybody. Romans chapter 10, verses 8, 9, and 10. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's like um, taking a, a we, can, we can dedicate certain time to the Lord. I think this manifests in fasting a lot for us now as Christians. We can fast and we can pray and it's dedicating a special time to God. But it's not... I, I also want to disassociate that from righteousness. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't make you more righteous. You can make yourself holy in the terms of separating yourself for a specific purpose for a certain amount of time. You know, because holy in, in a certain sense means just to separate oneself for a purpose. Um, but one thing that I, I was thinking about while you were talking that, that I wanted to bring up because I think it's a follow-up question that people might have is this concept that it's believed that Paul took a Nazarite vow after becoming a Christian. And we can see this in Acts chapter 18. Um, okay. Uh, Acts 18, starting in verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Chentre, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. That sounds like a Nazarite vow because what other vow do you take that requires you to cut your hair at the end of it? Uh, but this is, I would say this is not prescriptive. It's not something that we should be doing as Christians because otherwise that would be mentioned in the rest of the New Testament. I, um, but what Paul does say, I think that's really interesting uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, because we know that Paul, he was a Jew. He was a Christian Jew, a Messianic Jew. But his practice, we're told all throughout Acts, was to first go into the synagogues and preach to his fellow Jews and then move on to the Gentiles once he was rejected by the Jews. If he was rejected by them, he would move on to the Gentiles and begin preaching to them. And we find, uh, uh, um, you know, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this in verse 19, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So we have Paul, uh, you know, in this really interesting statement where he tells us that he does, he, he keeps certain traditions for the sake of his witness so that he can be accepted into congregations in order to preach the gospel message. So, and you can see that in Romans 11, you can see that. You know, he, he's he's very intense on that. Yeah. Corey, I have a question. Um, read Numbers 18, 1 to 7. I'll read it for you. So the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity concerned with your priesthood. And with you... Bring your brothers also, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join you and minister to you while you were sons or sons with you before the tent of the testimony. They shall keep guard over you and over the whole tent, but shall not come near the, t the vessel, rather vessels of the sanctuary or 
to the altar lest they are or lest they and you die. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, they shall join you and keep guard over the tent of meeting. This is the tabernacle. And uh, for many of the service of the tent, and no outsider, no outsider shall come near you. And you shall keep guard over the sanctuary and over the altar, that there may never again be wrath on the people of Israel. Never again. And behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among you, the people of Israel, and they are to gift you. What? They are to gift you, given to the Lord, to do the service of the tent of meeting. And you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and within the veil that you shall serve, I give you priesthood, a gift. And any outsider who comes in shall be put to death, death penalty. Verse eight, then the Lord spoke to Aaron, behold, I have given you a charge of the contributions made to me, all the consecrated things of the people of Israel I have given to you as a portion and to your sons as perpetual due. Now here's the question. And whosoever touches one slain or one that is slain with the sword. Oh, that's the next question. Yeah, oh, sorry. That's, sorry, that's the next question. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm the wrong question. That's okay. What do you think it, it means in verse seven when it says, I give you priesthood or your priesthood as a gift for service? But the outsider who comes in shall be put to death. It's a death penalty. Yes, definitely. All right. So the first part that hold the priesthood as a gift to Aaron and uh, also to Levi, and then like within that within those verses that we read, uh, the priesthood is a gift to Aaron and his sons, also to the Levites. But in another sense, the Levites are a gift to Aaron and his sons because they are helping Aaron and sons take care of the tabernacle and take care of the holy things and even guard it from outsiders. So Aaron and sons and Levites did not get a, a, a normal inheritance in the land of Israel. So the covenant that God strikes with Israel, the Mosaic covenant, the law, it was a land covenant. So essentially you do, you follow this covenant and I will give you this land and I will protect you in this land and you will be my children and I will be your God. That is the covenant, okay? Except for, for Levi and for Aaron and sons, they did not receive a physical inheritance like the tri the other tribes of Israel who got a portion of the land of Israel. Uh, they got some practical cities within within the other tribal allotments just so that they had somewhere to live and somewhere to raise their animals. But their inheritance was the tabernacle and the holy things. They were the priests of Israel, who were the priests of the world, okay? They were the priests of the priests, and, and this was their gift, that they were allowed to eat of the offerings, they were allowed to eat of the sacrifices, but they had to take it serious. So I think uh, that's the first part of verse 7. I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. So that second half, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. This is making it abundantly clear that, that they were not to go over the borders that God had set. God had given the priesthood to Aaron and sons and to the Levites, and that was that. No outsider was supposed to come in, and they needed to take this. Both Israel and the Levites needed to take this extremely seriously because if the Levites who were guarding the area of the tabernacle were just like, sure, come on in, they'd both die. So this was a very serious thing, keeping the holiness of God, the presence of God. This was where the presence of God was gonna be made manifest and meet with the people. The Levites were supposed to maintain that level of holiness. Now, incidentally, again in Samuel, in 2 Samuel, we can see how Israel forgot this rule. And so did King David. Everyone forgot this rule. And when they were moving the Ark of the Covenant, they didn't move it according to the law of Moses. The Levites weren't doing it right, and someone reached out to touch it, 
and he died because they were not treating the holy things the way they were supposed to be treated. They were going over those boundaries and thinking that it was no big deal. So we do see this happening. Um, we see this happening in the time period of the judges, and we see it very clearly in Samuel. I think it's important to recognize how far off base they came. You look at the book of Judges, you look at, after Joshua, you look at the book of Judges, you see the end of Judges, and you're like, I mean, you begin to read it and you're like, there's four or five problems right there. Yeah. And they're serious because God killed two of Aaron's sons yep. as a result. Right away. And so, but God, they forgot. Now, this is something that we need to pay attention to today because we need to read God's word. And this is why we do what we do because we need to understand what God has done because Jesus Christ, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And we need to pay attention to his order. Mm -hmm. And we pray that God shows us his ways, mm -hmm. teaches us his path. Very, very interesting. There's a level of seriousness, isn't there, when we there read is. this? Because I th too often today, we take Jesus's sacrifice for granted. Yes. Because we no longer have a physical high priest like, like this, a huge... Like, a, a, a purely human high high priest. He's he's with God right now. We have right Jesus hand of God. Christ yes, exactly. as our high priest, but it still cost him. Yes. Like we are able to have the Holy Spirit in our lives and have a relationship with God and come into his presence and pray to him because of, because of the death, yep. the blood of Jesus Christ, who is still our high priest. Yeah. And so there is an aspect of seriousness that should come with that. Yeah. And we, sh we, we, we are always mistaken when we treat our prayers flippantly, when we treat our worship service flippantly. We are always, it is always a mistake. Uh, like God will not be mocked. We gotta be really careful what we do. And, and you know, to me, one of the most terrifying lines that Jesus says, in the gospels is that there will be those that come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name, let us in. And he'll say, get away from me. I never knew you. I and know. that should cause a, a check in all of us to take a step back and go, whoa, this is a life and death game. We're, we're in a time when a lot of people are just saying, well, I can read the Bible and teach it. Mm -hmm. But I wanna remind you of what's said in the New Testament in James chapter three. Mm -hmm. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. James the Just. Not many of you shall become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Mm -hmm. So God is serious. Yep. And we need to pay attention to that. We can't just have everybody and his dog, cat, and everybody else be a teacher. It has to be somebody who's called by the Holy Spirit. He yeah. knows the Lord. And That's key. And there's got to be, there's got to be in all of us, not just in teachers, but also in all of us, but especially in teachers, yep. a level of humility when we approach the scriptures, recognizing that we are human. And so we have one perspective. Absolutely. But what does God tell Isaiah? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are high above your thoughts. So when we approach the scripture, we can read it one way and we got to be really careful when we teach other people about that because we have to recognize that we could be wrong. Yep. So make good, like study the scripture, try to understand the scripture, make good solid arguments based on the scripture, but never think like if you agree with God on everything, there's probably a problem because that means you're probably God is probably just your ideas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Listen, like, I get it. When you read the Bible, if there's nothing where you're like, oh no, <laughs> you're probably just interpreting it as you want it to be interpreted. Absolutely. You know, God is a different human being from you. I like, okay, so my anniversary with Matlock is actually tomorrow when we're taping this, we're taping this on Wednesday. It's going to go live on Friday, maybe Saturday morning, depending on how quickly. Brandon can edit this, but Malik and I have been married 10 years tomorrow on Thursday. And um, 
we don't agree on everything. And we've been working on this for 10 years really successfully. And I can't imagine just being like, oh, yeah, like everything's per like, you know what I'm trying to say? Let's, I, I, like, I, I, if I, you read the Bible and you're instantly like, oh, yeah, God is exactly the same as me. You got a problem because you can't even do that with another person. <laughs> I, I got news for you. I've been married to your mother for 42 years. There we go. Okay. <laughs> And your mother is a totally different you, person. You don't agree with mom on no, everything? And, and there's a totally different personality. But we've come to the, you know, you, you come to the conclusion where you realize, okay, yeah, she's different. Yeah. And her spirit is different than mine. But but together with God in the center, we we then, when we don't agree, we go to God. Yeah, And we say, okay, exactly. Lord, either I'm wrong, or she's wrong, or we're both right. And you've got to make it. And God fills in the gaps. He does. Where your mother and I disagree. God fills in the gap. And the, and the same is true for your relationship with God. When Absolutely. you learn that struggle with God is as old as humanity <laughs> itself. It is. You know, and and it's not always a bad it's not a bad thing. Yeah. He wants us to struggle with him and it will change us for the better. We'll have a character change, a name change like Jacob, Israel, something it, something yeah. good happens. So it's it's always worth wrestling with God. Okay, dad. Last question goes to you. Are you ready for it? I, again, I don't have a choice. We'll <laughs> okay, this is from Jolly Jester again. Got some good ones, Jolly Jester. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Numbers 19 verse 16 says, And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. I heard somewhere that this is perhaps why, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and Levite did not touch or help the man on the road because this person was in grave condition and they didn't want to become unclean if he died, though it broke a greater commandment in Leviticus 19, 18, to love your neighbor as yourself. Any thoughts on this? Uh, very simple. Uh, Jesus Christ was about breaking the religious rules, mm. okay? And the the wonderful beautiful Jewish people had a very strong religious view. Pharisees were here, Sadducees were here, Zealots were somewhere over here, and everybody had religious rules. Yep. Jesus Christ came into the scene and he broke them all, working on the Sabbath, the whole thing. It wasn't that he was working on the Sabbath, but he did good on the Sabbath. So he tells this parable in Luke chapter 10, and he begins to talk about, listen, I am here to prove to you what God said. We need to not be so dedicated to the structures mm. that we don't see the need. And there are people today, let me tell you, they're dedicated to the structures and they let people starve. I saw this when I went to India. I was 18 years old. I went to India and I saw a person die in front of me and I couldn't touch him because they're that like particular holding, religion yeah. was was holding me back because they, they said, you can't touch him. You can't, and they let him die. A, a child. And it was horrible. I couldn't eat for two weeks and it was just terrible. And I, I sensed that there are religious structures that will be so committed to the religious structure that they will ignore everything else. That's what Jesus was saying. Mm -hmm. In this parable, he spoke and he said, listen, don't be so committed to your religious structures. Mm -hmm. Don't be, but be committed to helping the people who are in need Jesus said also when when on a Sabbath day, if your donkey falls into a ditch, you get it out. You don't, I mean, you don't leave it there. Yeah. That's what he was saying. So the word that that comes to mind, it doesn't matter whether it was religious, or a lot of people have said, well, the Levite was too proud, he couldn't. No, I think the Levite actually understood this passage and he was so committed to that that he couldn't help somebody. Jesus said that's wrong. Yeah. It's Somebody's a problem. dying, you got to help them. And it was the Samaritan the despised person in society, who, who was the person who did the right thing. So that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's about the, the reason for the law. It's about the greater purpose. And this is, like you're saying, this was Jesus's main criticism against how Judaism had developed in his day and age, was that you're so dedicated to the letter of the law that you're missing the heart, the intention of God. Um, and, and, and it's why he would say you're so close to the kingdom when, when the religious leaders would say, uh, 
when when they would agree on the greatest commandments of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you know, Malachi and I have have spoken before on this concept of rules on rules. Uh, which was going on in the time period of Jesus. We see Jesus criticized this where there was rules about how to honor your mother and father, but the, the rules on how to honor your mother and father actually created a loophole for you to leave your mother and father out to starve, like out, out to lunch, right? Gone. And Jesus criticized these things. Um, be, and, but this is a very human thing. Even we today, we, we I, I, I see this a lot with new believers as well, because you just want life to be simplified. Maybe it's because our lives are too busy. I don't know. I'm not into the psychology of it. I don't know. But we want to simplify Christianity by going, okay, what are the rules? What can I do and what can I not do? What movies can I see and what movies can I not see? Who, what can I, what, what words can I say and what words can I not say? We want, what can, what clothes can I wear? How long do my clothes, modesty, how high does my neck have to be? We want rules. But we, we, the problem with rules on top of the rules is that often those rules be, replace the rules of God. The risk is that they will themselves become the new rules of God when in fact, God never wrote those rules. We wrote those rules and it can become a major problem. Absolutely. Because then we're following religion that is of our own making and it's not actually what God intended. And again, it goes back to the intention of God. Why did he write those rules in the first place? And I think a lot of times when we write our rules on rules, it's a very arrogant thing to do because we're assuming that we know exactly what God meant. And therefore, we can, we can figure out how every single human being should follow that rule in every culture and every time. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I totally agree with you. So we have to be really careful. We have to approach the scriptures with humility and with patience and with endurance, come back to it, read it, study it. Do you have any final words for the people? Well, no, my final words, keep reading the Bible. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we had some great questions here from Jolly Jester and everybody else. What did Excellent you think? Did you, did you enjoy the weekend? I enjoyed show? the weekend show. Yeah, I did. I enjoyed having, well, I might just have to have you back. <laughs> okay, whatever. I know. I, it's, I mean, I, I don't know. We, we're just doing our best to try to figure this out. Yeah, it's fun. Okay, guys, I want to hear what you think about the show, but also about these questions. Do you think we missed anything? Do you think we got it right? How would you have answered some of these questions? Uh, and if you have any questions for upcoming episodes, please, Please pop them down in the comment section below. Do not forget to like and subscribe, even share this video so that we can make more people aware uh, and uh, help them go through the Bible. All right, guys, until next week, happy reading and happy studying. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.